This video is part of an audiobook series featuring robots by the MIT Press Essential Knowledge Series by John Jordan in 2016. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Chapter 1 Introduction Television and cinema have helped propagate powerful American stories of technology. The Star Wars franchise is in many ways an updated Western, using space as a frontier, though maybe not the final one, and lightsabers as rifles. The impact of such icons, and possibly archetypes, as Robocop, Blade Runner replicants, the brilliant mannerly C-3PO, and Disney's WALL-E is wide and deep. Ask about the robots, Atlas, Motoman, Kiva, Beam, and other real-life robots that are reinventing warfare, the industrial workplace, and human collaboration, and most people have little sense of what real robots do or look like. But everyone knows the Terminator, complete with Austrian accent. In 2004, Chris von Alsberg's beloved children's book, The Polar Express, was made into a movie. Oscar-winning talent, including Tom Hanks, was wired up for digital motion capture, but the resulting characters came out, to use critics' words, creepy, eerie, and dead-eyed. The movie was a zombie train. For years, digital animators pushed for more polygons, more shades of color, more pixels, in short, more computing. But instead of delighting audiences with verisimilitude, they entered the uncanny valley, a paradox in which added artificial likeness weirds people out. After 2005, the Japanese female android Repli, Replie generated the same reaction, with its almost but not quite human-like features. In contrast to Hollywood, Boston Dynamics, between 2013 and 2016, a Google company, builds robots intended for use by the United States Armed Services. Non-classified YouTube videos of a robotic cheetah, humanoid, and pack animal have received tens of millions of views, giving many people their first look at state-of-the-art robotic science. Rather than the moderately large viewership, most striking to me was my students' reaction when a human kicked and shoved the big dog to show its stability. They gasped as if someone had struck an actual pet on camera. Robots are becoming more numerous, more capable, and more diverse. Over the long term, their economic, civic, and destructive impact will likely be on par with that of the automobile. In such a massive transition, people will care what happens and call for rules, norms, and paths of recourse. Citizens have a vested interest in work, wages, and workplace safety, in aging with dignity, in major changes in global warfare, in privacy, and in other things that robotics has the potential to change. Many factors, however, combine to make it hard to advance the discussions about what we want from today's and tomorrow's robots. Barriers to Informed Dialogue When an innovation emerges, the history of its naming shows how it goes from foreign entity to novelty to invisible ubiquity. A little more than a hundred years ago, automobiles were called horseless carriages, defined by what they were not rather than what they were. More recently, the U.S. military referred to drones as UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, continuing the trend of definition by negation. The word robot originated in the 1920s and was at first a type of slave. Robots are often characterized by their capabilities, their capabilities in performing dull, dirty, or dangerous tasks, sparing humans the need to perform them. The science and engineering of the field continue to evolve rapidly. Look no further than Google's self-driving car or the humanoid robots it acquired in the Shaft and Boston Dynamics deals. Given such rapid change, computer scientists cannot come to anything resembling consensus on what constitutes a robot. Some argue that a device qualifies if it can, one, sense its surroundings, two, perform logical reasoning with various inputs, and three, act upon the physical environment. Others insist a robot must move in physical space, disqualifying the Nest thermostat, while still others say that true robots are autonomous, excluding factory assembly tools. Reason one why robots are hard to talk about. The definitions are unsettled, even among the most expert in the field. 
Bernard Roth, a longtime professor of mechanical engineering who was associated with the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory from its inception, offers a more nuanced definition that draws on his long history in the field. Roth begins by doubting that, quote, a definition of what is or is not a robot will ever be universally agreed upon, end quote. Instead, he argues for a much more relative and conditional approach, continuing, quote, My view is that the notion of a robot has to do with which activities are, at a given time, associated with people and which are associated with machines, end quote. When relative capabilities evolve, so do conceptions. Again, quote, If a machine suddenly becomes able to do what we normally associate with people, the machine can be upgraded in classification and classified as a robot. After a while, people get used to the activity being done by machines, and the devices get downgraded from robot to machine, end quote. Reason number two why robots are hard to talk about is that definitions evolve evenly or unevenly and jerkily over time as social context and technical capabilities change. Expectations for robot for robotics are different than those for every other new technology because the vocabulary of robotics is so deeply a legacy of science fiction, both in literature and movies and on television. No technology has ever been so widely described and explored before its commercial introduction. The internet, cell phones, refrigeration and air conditioning, elevators, atomic energy, and countless other innovations that remade lives and landscapes saw the daylight of commercialization relatively quietly. Only later, if at all, did fiction invent vast numbers of fantasies, reaching audiences in the hundreds of millions, with the technologies at the center. In sharp contrast, fiction preceded and conditioned the science and engineering of robot robotics in an unprecedented fashion. And that is reason number three why robots are hard to talk about is that science fiction set the boundaries of the conceptual playing field before the engineers did. This paradox relates in part to the historical accident, the means by which mass market sci-fi was disseminated between 1940 and 2000. Paperback and comic books, cinema, television, all those came of age in that same period. Thus, the technologies of mass media helped create public conceptions of and expectations for a whole body of compu-mechanical innovation that had not yet happened. Complex, pervasive attitudes and expectations predated the invention of viable products. Given that modern Western robotics has been so strongly influenced by science fiction, why might that matter? A whole system of meanings and expectations has been created by fantasy rather than fact. Most important, science fiction has set expectations for real robots unrealistically high. Non-technical journalists, fiction writers, and even the Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom ask if a robot might, volish, might volitionally turn against its maker, even when that would be technically impossible. The point is here is that other cultural cargo was smuggled in with the stories and movies, assumptions about robots relative to work, warfare, and human ability or disability will need to be consciously revisited at the same time that we examine ethics, autonomy, and the supposed capacity for evil. A further naming issue must be raised here. Although it has neither the fictional nor especially the cinematic legacy of the robots, the related notion of artificial intelligence creates instant confusion and distrust amongst many non-roboticists. Elon Musk the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla Motors said in a 2014 MIT symposium that artificial intelligence, AI, might be humanity's biggest existential threat. Quote, I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. If I were to guess like what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. So we need to be very careful with the artificial intelligence. Increasingly, scientists think there should be some regulatory oversight, maybe at the national and international level, just to make sure that we don't do something very foolish. With artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. In all those stories where th there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, it's like, yeah, he's sure that he can control the demon. And in each case, it didn't work out. End quote. 
Note Musk's re recourse to myth and fiction as he attempts to explain his perspective on a vast scientific landscape. Moving away from wizards and demons, recall that the biggest successes in the field of artificial intelligence have come in controlled limited domains, like chess, CSGO, and the Jeopardy game show most visibly, but also type ahead search fields and automated mobile ad placement. It is critically important to distinguish between artificial general intelligence and eventually human-like cognition and domain-specific algorithms developed to do tasks such as credit scoring, fraud detection, or Google map route planning, each of which is essentially worthless outside of its tuned specialty. That said, deep learning is getting a lot better very fast. But, as I will argue, maybe the human brain isn't the proper benchmark for success. Yet the fear of artificial life forms surpassing humans is incapability is widespread. This fear persists, even though extremely basic tasks, such as getting the printer to connect, remain challenging. Whether robotic technologies are called AI, robots, or super-developed intelligent personal assistants, such as Apple's Siri or Spike Jones's Samantha in the film Her, matters only slightly. The fear and uncertainty generated by fictional representations far exceed human reactions to real robots, which are often reported to be underwhelming. Thus, reason number four, why robots are hard to discuss. Robotics bleeds into other technologies that are even more poorly understood and ominously portrayed in many cultures. Path Dependence Every new technology that begins in a laboratory and enters wide use passes through a series of stages. Early on, first basic, then applied science can be prohibitively difficult. Engineering at this stage of development is hard, and the primary question at hand is, how can we make this work? Slightly later, before entrepreneurs and others solve the business model question, which is, how might this technology make money, there comes a time when des design decisions are, decisions are made that will shape much of the technology's future impact. Alternating versus direct current electricity, railroad gauges, and typewriter keyboard layouts are all examples of an economic notion called path dependence. Today's choices are constrained by technical decisions made in the past. In the fields of artificial intelligence, robotics, sensors, and information collection and processing, among others, we are at a point when people beyond the engineers and scientists should be involved in the discussion of how do we make this work? How do we make this work is still a live issue, but we also have a choice among multiple paths forward. In short, it is time to start asking more people what they desire and what they resist from these technologies. Robotics has many potential implications for economic livelihoods and wealth accumulation, identity and relationships, citizenship and warfare, privacy and individual agency. Design choices involve far more than only engineering constraints. Politics, economics, luck, and other forces are also at work, but thus far are being addressed only peripherally. To make this notion less abstract, consider two examples. Jaron Lanier tells a story in his book titled You Are Not a Gadget, a story that applies beautifully. When the Musical Instrument Digital Interface, or MIDI, first connected synthesizers to computers, a design decision was made based on the state of computer science to make keyboard triggers essentially binary. Either the key was pressed in the digital domain, or it was not. Real music like the blues, however, allows musicians to bend or otherwise shape notes, such as on a guitar or harmonica. MIDI music cannot sound this way because of the path dependence related to the initial specification. As a result, we have had 30 years of what Lanier calls beepy sounding electronic music, and it didn't have to be that way. More recently, Google tried to expand and integrate its social services such as YouTube, Gmail, and Grand Central, called Google Vo Voice since 2009, into a network titled Google Plus, launched in 2011. For a number of reasons, the service insisted that people sign up with their real-world names and gender identity. Real name identification had the upside of reducing flame wars in some online forums and made life easier for Google to track user behavior across its properties for advertising purposes, but it, posted, it posed a privacy nightmare for some people. 
at least one transgender person's sexual identity was revealed in a text message without consent because of Google's integration of Google Plus information into Android address books. In 2014, Google co-founder Sergey Brin, who was intimately involved in Google Plus design decisions, admitted, quote, I am probably the worst person to speak about social. I'm just not a very social person, end quote. As with countless design choices, that decision had far-reaching consequences. In addition to personal inconvenience and worse, Brin's rigid insistence on real-name integration across Google's many websites alienated many users and probably contributed to Google Plus's weak public reception. Later, in 2014, Google abandoned the policy. Why Robotics Matters – Some Concrete Considerations how does robotics differ from what we came to know of digital computing from 1950 until 2005 or so? Here are just a few examples of big, complex issues we need to confront, and quickly. Issue 1. With cameras and sensors everywhere, on telephone poles, on people's faces, in people's pockets, in the ground, on water mains and monitoring seismic activity, and in the sky— drone photography has given rise to a rapidly evolving body of legal judgment and contestation, the boundaries of privacy, security, and risk are all being reset. What are the rights of the observed and the responsibilities of the observer? A powerfully dystopian version of pervasive monitoring, peer pressure in social networks, and winner-take-all markets can be found in Dave Eggers' novel, The Circle. Issue 2. When robots enter combat, how and when will they be hacked? Who will program a self-driving suicide bomb? The Islamic State was reported to be doing so in early 2016. Are drone pilots or robot software writers subject to the Geneva Convention? When robots administer torture, who is responsible? This technology, so aggressively developed by the military, will open multiple debates in the realm of warfare and conflict. Issue 3. Computer science, informative theory, or information theory, statistics, and physics, in terms of magnetic media, are all being stress-tested by the huge volumes of data generated by our increasingly instrumented planet. Sensors are intrinsic to robots. The two domains are often difficult to distinguish. A general electric jet engine is reported to take off, on average, every two seconds worldwide. Each engine generates a terabyte of data per flight even when a 10 to 1 compression takes its figure down to 100 gigabytes per flight, that's about a million DVDs worth of raw data every day. Because it cannot all be kept for any length of time, sampling, further compressing, logging, and other data actions must be perfected. Dealing with information problems at this scale, in nearly every domain, raises grand challenge, scale hurdles in business, academy, medicine, and even sports. Issue number four, the half-life of technical knowledge appears to diminish ever faster. Machine learning, machine vision, and robots and other fields are evolving rapidly, complicating employment patterns and career evolution. Robots will obviously displace manual laborers, but engineers, programmers, and scientists will also be hard-pressed to maintain current skills. In addition, we are increasingly dealing with platforms— such as Microsoft Windows, Apple iOS, and Google Maps, rather than products. Platforms are far more powerful, such as Chunka Mui and Paul Carroll point out. Every Google self-driving car learns from the experiences of every other Google self-driving car. Whew, that's powerful. Accordingly, how will we learn to think about a world in which Google could put cars, robots, thermostats, androids, and phones on a common Android software base. Platform economics, involving as they do such key concepts as lock-in and license exclusivity, have powerful and far-reaching social effects. Issue number five, what are the rules of engagement when computing that moves about in the wild? A woman wearing a Google Glass headset was assaulted at a bar after she violated an implied social contract. Self-driving cars don't yet have clear liability laws. 3D printing of guns and of patented or copyrighted material has yet to be sorted out. Nobody yet knows what happens when people can invoke facial recognition of a stranger on the sidewalk. 
Google could see consumer or EU blowback if it uses Nest sensor data to drive ad targeting. As a reminder of how much these rules matter, when the telephone was first introduced, it was socially impolite to greet someone to whom you have not been introduced. As a result, many languages have two words of greeting, one for the phone, in French they say allo, and one in person, bonjour. Alexander Graham Bell had his own preferred solution of in English, using ahoy as the telephonic greeting. 130 years later, we have much to negotiate in the next wave of physical computing, including the norms that apply to social life. Issue s- number six. How will these technologies augment and amplify human capability? Whether through exoskeletons, care robots, telepresence, or prostheses, the human condition will change in shape, reach, and scope in the next 100 years. At the same time, how will humans enable the new computing models? An ATM or self-driving car needs to be instructed, as does the Da Vinci surgical system, which the robotic does not really qualify as a robot. The potential for collaborations between human and compute mechanical systems is mind-boggling. How many more Stephen Hawking's, Adrian Hazlitt Davies, or Robin Miller's will we see? But first, a variety of technical and non-technical challenges must be identified, named, and negotiated, not just solved. And how will access to these augmentations be allocated? Issue number seven. Compared to keyboards, screens, and mice, robotics helps introduce a myriad of new ways for humans and machines to interact. Nods, winks, finger swipes, spoken commands, and even brainwaves can generate action. Given human variation, cultural differences, vast differences in languages, and physical constraints like power consumption or water resistance, how will humans learn to drive all these new tools? One fascinating set of decisions relates to color. Many mobile robots currently share a clinical white color, including Sony Ibo, Honda Asimo, Bestic, Jibo, Beam, and Atlas II. Recall that for years, desktop PCs were uniformly beige, then black or gray became common until Apple redefined the color spectrum with shades of turquoise and tangerine. Given that computers close to humans convey layers of meaning, it will be worth watching how the red Baxter robot is received, and if black or brown variations of autonomous robots might be developed, potentially for less Caucasian markets. Issue number eight. The infrastructure enabled and required by robotics and related fields, such as the Internet of Things or IoT, looks very different from that of an industrial economy. Systems get bigger as needs increase and technologies of management and control get better. In part, these changes reflect new risks. Robotic technologies also require different kinds of workplaces. No more need for warehouses to be air-conditioned for human comfort, but assembly line bots need safety cages. Transit systems will change as robots on the move, whether on a roadway, in airspace, or in a hospital corridor, require different signals and safety precautions than human drivers do. Together, these eight sets of issues and questions involve law, belief, economics, education, public commons, public safety, and human identity, along with technical fields of power management, magnetic storage, material science, algorithmic calculation, and more. Given the breadth and magnitude, pop pop, of its impacts, robotics is simply too important, and now too close at hand, to be left only to technical specialists. Summary. The laws, stories, economic forces, and blind spots accompanying robots and robotics are neither inevitable nor obvious. They take work to craft, untangle, and assess. The next wave of computing will introduce profound changes, which will eventually rival those brought about by the automobile, household electricity, or running water. As an example, consider the profound impact of drone warfare in the absence of public or even congressional debate over its ethical, political, and strategic implications. Given that the technologies for self-driving cars, embedded or face-mounted computers and sensors, and autonomous robots are all coming to market in a matter of months rather than decades, the circle of people involved in overseeing them needs to be widened. Time and again, engineers and scientists have answered the question, how can we make this work? 
Now it's time for more of us to ask what realistic choices can be made in each of these domains and to help make those choices. The process is anything but straightforward. People often don't know what they want when presented with known alternatives, as a study of choice architectures reveals. As ways of, ex of assessing new, new products, focus groups, and other techniques for market research are fatally flawed. Prior to the launch of the iPhone, smartphone sales were largely confined to BlackBerry and Nokia devices, none of which had glass interfaces. Five years later, both companies had essentially had become essentially irrelevant as Apple and Google's mo Android mobile operating systems dominated the market, even though both Research in Motion and Nokia spent heavily on research and development. So far, robot markets have yet to declare their preferences. That said, for private drones, face-mounted computers, and other technologies, the time has come to consider rules of the road, outright prohibitions, and warning signs to be watched in the early phases of adoption. The field of robot ethics addresses some of these issues. One line of thinking dates back to Isaac Asimov, and considerable effort is still spent in wrestling with problems of human versus compu-mechanical agency, particularly with regard to human harm. People also have a deep-rooted habit of attributing cognizance and motive, like the machine is thinking, when this is neither when neither are present. Closer to our own time, the moral dimension of military robots programmed to shoot first in the interest of self-preservation has drawn worldwide attention, as from the NGO group Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. Elsewhere, Steven Pinker, a leading scientist of the brain, is clear in his stance on human moral responsibility, saying, quote, Why give a robot an order to obey orders? Aren't, why aren't the original orders enough? Why command a robot not to do harm? Wouldn't it be easier never to command it to do harm in the first place? End quote. In addition, the emerging capabilities of artificial intelligence, a field with both contested self-definitions and broad application to robotics, make boundaries between humans and machines even fuzzier. Some of the design decisions that will be made in the coming years have high stakes, which, with consequences that involve the very essence of human agency, identity, and belief. Robotics introduces a new layer of complexity into the fields of artificial intelligence, big data, and ultimately, human meaning. Not only does the long history of human efforts to create artificial life see a new chapter, but also people can now create artificial life in vast networks that will behave differently than a single entity. Frankenstein's creature can be un understood as a forerunner of the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot, but there isn't as visible a precedent for self-tuning sensor nets or swarms of self-organizing drones. The change is happening at a faster rate of technological innovation than humans are accustomed to, raising further complications. This transition is in the early stages, and human intelligence is often held up as the ideal to which machine designers should aspire. Ray Kurzweil's entire singularity notion is based on, quote, the idea that we have the ability to understand our own intelligence, to access our own source code, if you will, and then revise and expand upon it, end quote. At the same time, machines that surpass humans in capability represent a new chapter in the technics out of control meme that the historian of technology Langdon Winner has so ably cataloged. Although caution in the early adoption of any new technology is prudent, as examples from nuclear power cl clearly show, our fear of robotic technologies is largely misplaced. According to Rodney Brooks, the CEO of Rethink Robotics and a longtime MIT researcher in the field, achieving AI is really difficult. For silicon circuitry to develop conscious malevolence is likely at least a century off. As Brooks noted in November of 2014, quote, if we are spectacularly lucky, we will have an AI in the next 30 years with the intentionality of a lizard, and robots using that AI will be useful tools, and they probably won't really be aware of us in any serious way. Worrying that about AI that will be intentionally evil to us is pure fear-mongering and an immense waste of time." End quote. At some levels, humanity is at a stage somewhere between Da Vinci and the Wright brothers in the development of powered flight. 
Airplanes do not fly by flapping wings, nor do birds carry 500 people 9,500 miles. Projects to reverse engineer the human brain, run, running as it does more on chemistry than on electrons, seem to be limited in their applicability. Instead of Hollywood archetypes and linguistics, linguistic illusions, we need the lab work for which Orville and Wilbur Wright are less appreciated. They invented not just the airplane, but significant advances in the science of aeronautics, as well as the method for flying the airplane. The human metaphors embedded in robotics and artificial intelligence are shaping progress in this field, likely holding us back as much as they inspire. 22nd century AI will probably be no more mimic the human brain than the airplane mimics a bird or a wheel mimics a leg. Abstracting the problem beyond biomimicry represents an initial step in this progress or in this process. Who will build the equivalent of the wind tunnel for cognition? Regarding a, regardless of the state of computing, science fiction, or filmmaking, we are about to colonize new ter territory on the technological frontier. And though it is appropriate to honor the, the pioneers, it is equally appropriate for the settlers to have a voice in the laws, customs, economics, and social conventions that we will observe. Because we live in ever closer proximity to computing that inhabits and transforms our physical world, it is time to question the mental models we use to describe robotics. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.